morning we're going to be picking up where we left off last time I was, I was here in Luke chapter 8. Um, and uh, what we've seen throughout this chapter, one of the major themes we've seen here in Luke chapter 8 is how to get faith and y- how to use it in everyday experiences of life. In the first section of this, sap- of this chapter, we saw how Jesus laid the foundation we saw Jesus lay the foundation by teaching his disciples that faith comes from receiving the word of God into an understanding heart. Now thereafter, his disciples, his followers, are put through a series of examinations to see how much they'd really learned and where their commitments lie. If you were with us last time, we covered a couple of miracles that Jesus performed that proved how important and how powerful his word actually is. There, we learned that we must be tested before, that our faith must be tested before it can be trusted. And that following him, following Jesus, will also mean testifying in what he's done for you. So this week, as we conclude this chapter, we'll be looking at a couple more miracles he performed. One that was unintentional, and the other that was plainly intentional. This week's stories will help us to understand what fearless faith looks like, and the kind of fearless faith that Jesus wants us to have. So before we get into this week's, uh, or this, our, our, the word of God this morning, let's ask the Lord to open our hearts and speak to us. Lord, Heavenly Father, it is great and it is wonderful that we are gathered here together, Lord. That you've ordained this day from eternity past for all of us to, to, to worship together and to hear your word as, as a church, Lord. And I just pray that you will anoint this place, Lord, that you will fill this room with your spirit, Lord, that you will just soften the hearts and minds of everyone here, Lord. It is such a great honor, and we're humbled that, we, that we're given this opportunity. I pray that I may speak truth, Lord, and, and that you will use me as an interest instrument to, to speak that truth. Lord, we dedicate this time to you right now, completely and totally to you. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So we're in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, and we're going, and we're going to be starting here in verse 40. Verse 40. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. And there the word of God says, When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then, a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house, because he had, a, he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years, who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any, approached him from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming, are hemming you in and pressing against you. Someone did touch me, he j- said Jesus. I know that power has, has gone out for me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down um, before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So, 
having left the Gerasenes region, we're told that Jesus returned back to Capernaum. And upon arriving, he was greeted, he was greeted by a welcoming crowd. And within that crowd, however, were a man and a woman who had desperate burdens, real serious burdens to share with Jesus. The first person to meet him was a man named Jairus, who was a leader, who we're told was a leader in the synagogue. As a synagogue leader, Jairus was responsible for arranging the synagogue for meetings and probably leading the council of elders in the synagogue. Nevertheless, in that moment when he met Jesus, the last thing on his mind was his status or his position. All that mattered to him was his one and only daughter, his 12 little girl, his little princess. She was dying. So, as, again, as soon as he saw Jesus step foot on dry ground, Jairus fell down at his feet and begged him, pleaded with him to come to his house. Well, our Lord didn't hesitate. He decides to go with him. But because of the amount of people that were there to greet him, we're told that it, it, it was just so crowded that he was nearly, that people were nearly crushing him. They were, and as a result of that, they were having a hard time getting to that house as quickly as possible. So as he was trying to push through, one woman in particular stopped him without really actually meaning to. See, Dr. Luke explains that this woman had a hidden need, a burden that she had been living with for as long as Jairus' daughter had lived. For the past 12 years, this woman had been suffering from a medical condition that regularly caused severe menstrual bleeding. As a result, not only was this causing severe, tremendous amount of physical pain and discomfort, but her bleeding also made her ceremonially and socially unclean. Now, according to the Jewish ideas of the time, this if this woman touched anybody, touched anything, that person or that thing would impart her unclean, uncleanliness, uncleanness to them. An uncleanness that would allow them, that would not allow them to take part of any aspect of Israel's worship. Luke also admits that throughout this time she had spent all her life savings and income on doctors but wasn't able to be healed by any of them. Now, if you were to read Mark's account of this story, he adds that she actually had gotten worse because of them. Now, I want to take a moment here to, to just to point a few things out. During the same 12 years, the home ha of Jairus had been filled with joy and laughter the home of this woman was filled with despair and suffering. The rabbis having taught that her hemorrhaging was a result of immorality. And because of that, this woman would have been probably excommuni excommunicated from the synagogue. Her husband probably had forced her and more than likely she was ostracized from the community. So you see, for 12 long years, her life was just a miserable tra tragedy. Now I find this very, I find this contrast very interesting because maybe some of you have spent the last 12 years in joy and in delight. But not to sound like a bummer here, not to sound like a, like morbid or, or, or tragic, but 
difficulty and tragedy will strike every one of us at some point because it rains on the just and the unjust because no temptation comes to us but that which comes common or that which is common to all men because in this world we're told we are promised that we're going to have tribulation so right now if you're in a good season rejoice but prepare now is the time more than ever to be in the word to be worshiping the lord to be growing in faith because tomorrow when tragedy strikes it'll be too late you will not have the resources necessary to see you through the time of difficulty if you don't prepare for the day of prosperity. Conversely, those of you who may have been or are, have been miserable for the last 12 years or months or weeks, good news, you don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what miracle is about to happen. And let me tell you this, and, let me, and I promise you this, the Lord will enter your situation in a way that will blow your mind if, like this woman, you seize the opportunity to draw near to him. We need to be in a place where the Lord is traveling. Where is that? He promises to be in the midst of his people. He promises to be heard in the word. He promises to res be responsive to your prayers. So whether you're going through a hard time, a bad season, or a good season, we have to just completely hold on to him. And as I mentioned, during those bad times, even actually during those good times, the more we hold on to him, the more we just walk with him, the, 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 the more we obey him, when those bad times hits, we'll be able to, it'll be easier for us to, to cling to him. And when times are bad, we'll never forget. We'll always know that he's there and that tomorrow will come, will, may produce a miracle and that things may change. Some of you know, and I mentioned this many times before, but for 10 long years, my wife prayed for me. I was in a bad place. I said a lot of dumb things and I acted really bad and she prayed. She prayed, she didn't give up through that, through those 10 years of, of hardship. And it was a hardship for her. But she held on to the Lord and the Lord got her through that. And he did, the Lord did a miracle in me and did a miracle in our marriage. And, and now we're at a different place than we were back then. And we left all that behind. Now we're just looking forward to what, tomorrow will bring and we know that even if we go through another difficult season we believe and trust and that he will get us through it and we must we know that we must hold on to him regardless of the kind of tragedies that may come our way I know it's easier said than done but but I honestly believe that I've seen what he's done in the past and I know what he can I know what he can do and as long as I hold on to his word, as long as I hold on to him, as long as I, I cling to him, I believe that he's going to get me, her, our kids, all of you through the pain and suffering. Well, this defiled, destitute, discouraged, and desperate woman saw Jesus as her last hope. And she had 
no doubt at all, no doubt at all that he could heal her. But the thing is, her intention wasn't to deliberately stop him and explain her entire medical condition, her entire medical history. No, all she wanted was just one opportunity to touch him. So when that opportunity began to pass by her, she pushed through the mob. She squeezed her hand right through all those people, <coughs> through any kind of gap that she can find. She squeezed her hand in there, her arm in there, and just extended her hand as far as she could. And as he passed her by, he she was just barely able to touch the end of his robe. And at that precise moment, we're told at the end of verse 44 that instantly her bleeding stopped. Now, if you think about it, this wasn't a healing that could be easily seen or verified. And maybe for a moment, this woman may have thought that she was the only one who knew what had happened. But as I mentioned earlier, she wasn't going to, she wasn't there to seek his attention. She wasn't going, she not, wasn't going to go out there and say, hey, Jesus, guess what just happened to me? My, my menstrual bleeding just stopped. No, I, I, I really believe that she wasn't going to make such a private matter public. Therefore, it's quite possible that after feeling that she had been healed, all she wanted to do was to slip back into the obscurity of the crowd. But that wasn't the plan. Her plans were obstructed, were suddenly interrupted when she distinctly hears these three words above the shouts of that chaotic crowd who touched me. Peter and the other disciples thought that this was a silly question. All kinds of people were shoving, pushing, and touching him. Now keep in mind again that according to verse 42, that because of the amount of people that were there, Jesus was nearly getting crushed. So, for Jesus to just limit it to one person would have been an impossible question to answer. It would have been like me asking Isaac, hey, who did I talk to today? And he'd be like, what? Who did you talk to? You talked to a bunch of people. I saw you. But the thing is, this, our Savior, by asking that question, he wasn't asking this to Peter or to any of his disciples that were near him, nor was he generally inquiring about who had touched him. What Jesus was actually doing was asking this question to a specific person in the crowd. But just to be clear, so that there isn't any misunderstanding, so that that person understood what he was talking about. He says again, someone did touch me. I know because power has gone out from me. The thing is, our Lord had, pow had the power to heal without consciously doing anything. But he also controlled his power. Here, he knew he had healed, and he knew there was someone in the crowd who had received a powerful healing from him. Thus, the, the point of his inquiry was to, th was to specifically find out, uh, wasn't to specifically find out who did it, because, I mean, he, he's Jesus. He 
would know who touched him. He, I believe that he absolutely knew who touched him. If he didn't know, all he had to do was ask his father in heaven, and his father would have revealed it. But rather, he asked for these two reasons. First, he wanted that woman to just boldly step forward and acknowledge what God had done for her. And secondly, he wanted her to reveal herself so that he can just have a conversation with her, so that he can just talk to her, so that he can just encourage her and minister to her. What Jesus did privately, he now tells this woman to declare publicly. Now, this wasn't to embarrass her. I believe Jesus wanted her just to testify publicly. Why? In order that Jairus, Jairus might be able to handle what he was about to hear. Likewise, again, there are people around you who are hurting, who are suffering. Tremendous amount of maybe physical pain, spiritual pain. They're hurting. And they need to hear what the Lord has done for you in order that your own faith, their own faith, might be strengthened. Maybe some of you have gone through serious illness to the point of death. There are people around you who want to hear what God did for you, who want, who need that encouragement, who are maybe in that place that you were in where you just felt like giving up. But the Lord gave you the strength, the, the encouragement to continue to move on. He wants you to share those stories, those experiences. Maybe you've also suffered through serious marriage problems. And now there's another couple, maybe a younger couple, that are going through something similar. Your stories, your experiences may bless them, will bless them. My wife and I, we, because of everything we've been through, we have a heart. We're married couples. We know that that it can, the Lord can do a miracle in a marriage regardless of how ugly things have gotten. We know that he will restore marriages if those two couples just come hand in hand and, and surrender their lives to him. I also have a heart for young people who are going through depression, who are going through maybe suicidal thoughts. I suffered through all that as a teenager. I experimented with a lot of things when I was a teenager just to numb myself from the pain I was feeling. And now I just want to tell the young people, hey, you know what? There's something that can truly help you to heal you from that pain you're going through. Again, maybe some of you have stories. Crazier stories and stories than mine that will help to encourage others. Go out there, speak them, proclaim them. Tell your testimony of what God did for you. That alone, God works powerfully through those stories. He will change lives through them. Well, again, from, from her perspective, when she heard Jesus' words, she instantly realized there was now one other person who knew what had happened. 
So not only did she know that he knew what had happened, but she also understood that he was also asking her to take a step of faith. Fearfully, this woman edged, edged forward and admitted her action. She testified to what Jesus, to, to Jesus of her need and his deed. So how would Jesus react? Would he be angry because someone had sneaked off with some of his power? No, of course not. Jesus cared for people. He loved people. He had compassion on people and wanted to have and wanted them to have a wholeness and healing. He wanted to be he wanted them to have be free of suffering. He wanted them to know his love. And very often we see, we read that that's exactly what he did. And that's what he did here with this woman. Her public confession was rewarded with a public commendation of her faith by none other than Jesus himself. And a public pronouncement of his peace upon her. Nevertheless, here's something she understood and that we as Christians, as believers need to understand as well. No one ever touches Jesus by faith without knowing it and without receiving a blessing. No one ever confesses him openly without being strengthened in assurance of salvation. This blessing is also the only place where he addressed anyone in, in the entire New Testament as daughter. This is the only place where we see that word. So by calling her that, it assured her that because of her faith in the Lord was genuine, her healing by him was complete. She didn't have to worry that one day it'll come back. Maybe some of these doctors that she went to go see and paid all this money to gave her a false hope, false assurance, and maybe they stopped the bleeding for a while, but it always came back. But she knew. She knew that by him calling her daughter, that was it. She would never have to suffer again. She was completely healed. This, there are certain people who come to church determined to hear from the Lord. And those who are will leave here having heard from, from him, having heard from the Lord. Others will come out of obligation or habit or religious duty, not really expecting to hear from the Lord. And they will leave here, sadly, unfortunately, without hearing from him. Well, let me tell you this. Jesus wants to smile on you, wants to smile down on you, just like he did on this lady who was one among the multitude. And he wants to say to you, son, daughter, be of good cheer. In faith, you broke through the crowd and received from me the help you desperately needed. Beautiful thought. And I hope that that's how you want to leave here today. That all of you who are sitting here are expecting to hear from the Lord. If you haven't already, that he will speak to you. You have to be open to it. You have to just, you, it's one of those things where you come to church and you're like, Lord, I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you. But you can't, you won't be able to hear from him, from him 
if your mind is elsewhere. If you're worried about this and you're worried about that and, and that's all your mind just keeps going to about where are you going to go for Christmas? Who, what fa- side of the family are you going to go see and where are you going to travel to? And, you know, what are you going to buy for that $5 elephant, white elephant, you know, gift exchange? When you're sitting here, when you're worshiping, hearing, uh, hearing the word being read, hearing the message being preached, you have to have a heart, a mind of, of being completely open to what the Lord wants to say to you. And he will speak to you. He will, whether, now you've heard me say this also, whether it's one word, whether it's a sentence, whether it's the entire message, he wants to speak to you, and he will. Now, unfortunately for Jairus, as much as he would have been, as much as he would have liked to have been happy for this woman and celebrate with her, you know, because of what just happened, he could only think of one, one thing, his dying daughter. And he wanted nothing more than to be by her side. He knew that the longer the, delay, the longer they delayed, the shorter she had to live. So in his mind, in his heart, he had this urgent need to get Jesus to his house ASAP, as soon as possible. So let's pick up in verse 49 and read the remainder of this chapter. Luke chapter 8, verse 49. While he was still speaking, someone came, to, came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be saved. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her, but he said, stop crying, but because she's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead and called out and and so he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he instructed them to tell no one about what had happened. As you can see, this is one of those stories that goes from tragedy to triumph. (coughs) From hopelessness to hopefulness. From death to life. Sometime during the healing of the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, Jairus' 12-year-old daughter had succumbed to her illness and died. The news left Jairus heartbroken and devastated. For those of you who are fathers and have daughters, let me tell you, as I have a 10-year-old daughter, and the thought of that, something like that happening to her, it is just crushing. I can't imagine the pain, the, the, the heartbreak. You know, anything, just when I hear her cry, I'm sleeping during the middle of the day because the hours I work, but there have been a few times I would hear her cry and or scream, and, and it wakes me up right away, and I'm rushing to, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I just stubbed my toe. I'm like, oh, okay, honey. You know, but I, 
you know, I, I panic, I worry. Everything that she, she does and when she gets sick, I'm like, you know, I, are you okay, honey? You go, you need anything? And, and my, my wife, she's like, you okay? What's wrong with you? You're like paying more attention to her than to me. Um, but it's just, you know, that relationship that, that a father has with his daughter. So again, it must have been devastating. His one and only daughter, his, his precious princess, was gone. The messenger that, that had broken the news then suggested the matter just be dropped. And there wasn't any point in having Jesus come to the house anymore. Why should he? She's dead. See, he thought that Jesus only dealt with the living, those who were sick and demon-possessed. He hadn't heard that there was already an instance in, in Luke where he had healed a woman's, a, a widow's one and only son. So she, he had no idea that he also, Jesus also dealt with the dead. Sadly, again, he was under the impression that Jesus could only help the sick and dying. But once death hits, that's it. Nothing could be done. Jesus, however, wouldn't allow anyone to dismiss him so easily. So before Jairus could react, the Lord gives him words of comfort, encouragement, and promise. Tells him, don't be afraid. Only believe, and she will be saved. What does he mean by this? Don't be afraid. Sounds almost cruel for Jesus to say this to a man who had just lost his daughter. But Jesus knew that fear and faith, they don't mix. They don't go together. You can't have fear and faith together. Before Jairus could really trust Jesus, he had to decide to put fear away, to get rid of it. He then says this. He then tells them, only believe. By this he meant don't try to believe and be afraid at the same time. Don't try to believe and figure it all out. Don't try to believe and make sense of the delay. Instead, only believe. The only thing Jairus had to believe was Jesus' word. Everything else told him that his daughter was gone forever. This, if you think about it, this was both the best place to be and also the hardest place to be. Yet, through it all, our Lord proceeded, still proceeded to go to Jairus, Jairus at, to his house. And upon arriving there, Jesus mentioned for three members of his inner circle of his disciples to enter with him as well as the parents. By then, the mourning rites had begun as neighbors and professional mourners put ashes on their heads and cried and wailed to God over the child's death. When he saw all this, when he heard the cries of the mourners, he told all of them, stop crying because she's not dead, but asleep. Again, a moment of crisis for the parents. Believe the neighbors and friends or believe Jesus. Was their child asleep? 
or was she dead? Now, of course, she was dead because her spirit had left her body. But to Jesus, death was only sleep. This image is often used in the New Testament to describe the death of believers. And you can see that in John chapter 11, Acts chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Just as sleep is a normal experience that we do not fear. Now, if you're not a little kid, scared of the, scared of the dark, I imagine none of you guys are, or ladies are scared of going to sleep. Well, let me tell you this, those, if you're a born-again believer here this morning, you shouldn't fear death either. Because he says that death is like sleep. Is like sleep. You see, it is the body that sleeps, not the spirit. For the spirit of the believer goes to be with Christ. And again, we're told that in Philippians chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The moment this body decays or the dies, our spirit automatically goes to be with the Lord. And there will come a time at the resurrection where physical bodies will rise and we'll have bodies like Christ. But until that moment, our spirit, we're there with him. So it's just like sleep. And, and therefore, again, you know, I was... You know, and I, I was having a conversation with somebody this past week, and I was just mentioning again that the difference between me and many unbelievers is that I don't fear death. If I was to die in this instance or knew that I was going to die, I would be sad. I would be sad for my family, and I would be sad for, you know, because I would be you know, going to miss a lot of great events, but... I know that, again, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And there is no greater, the way the Lord describes it, there is no greater joy than to be up there with Him, to be in His presence. And although, again, the thought of it is sad, I know that there's no, there's a, being with Him, there's, it's, it's, going to be greater than any kind of party or joy that I've ever experienced. So do I fear it? No. Do I fear how it's going to happen? Maybe. I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't, wanna, I don't want to drown or, you know, or be burnt alive. Sounds scary, but that's another, that's another story. I believe that you'll give us the grace to, 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 to endure it. You know, I won't get totally into that, but do I fear death? No. I'm at, I'm at that point. And, uh, and hopefully you are too. And if not, let me tell you, there's no reason to fear. If you've totally trusted and believed and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit is living in you, there's no reason to fear death. He's with you and you'll be with Him. Again, at the resurrection, the body will be awakened and glorified, and God's people will share in the image of Christ. Well, it appears that the neighbors had made their choice. Their choice was clear when they began to laugh at him because they knew a dead child when they saw one. But here's the thing. They didn't know the power of Jesus. So Jesus turned towards the child. As she was laying there. He reached out his hand and told her, child, 
get up. Now this command can be read in at least two ways. Wake up from sleep or be raised from the dead. But as, as soon as the last words, the sounds of the, those last words were spoken, Luke tells us that her spirit returned to her and life appeared to the lifeless. That 12-year-old girl then stood up, and when she did, Jesus handed her to her parents and gave orders that she be given something to eat. Now, why would he say that? Why would he give, why would he tell the parents, give her something to eat, you know, do it right now? He did that because he wanted everyone to see that she was alive, that she was alive and well, and not just a spirit returned from the dead. She wasn't just a zombie. She was just like you and me, who ate, who slept, got tired, went to the bathroom, did all the things. She, she was just, she, she was alive. Astonishment captured the parents. How could this be? Who can we tell? The whole world must know about this wonderful news. But unexpectedly, Jesus gave them their, their witnessing command. Don't tell. Don't say anything. And he said this. Why did he say this? He said this because he knew that many of the people that would hear their message would, will, or many people that would see this little girl would see, yet not see. Many of these, a lot of these people that would hear this little girl laugh again would hear and yet not get it. They would hear the story of how Jesus raised her from the dead and they wouldn't understand. They may talk about a miracle, but they will not recognize the one who performed the miracle. They're not ready to believe the Son of God is in their midst. Miracles were not at the center of Jesus' ministry. They needed to see the end before they could tell about this innocent one. The end needed to happen first, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and him being, him rising up to heaven. All that needed to happen first before this story could be told, before people can actually start understanding what happened. Now, resurrection is a picture of the way Jesus Christ saves lost sinners and raises them from spiritual death. The Gospels record three such resurrections, though Jesus probably performed many more. In each instant, the person raised gave evidence of life. The widow's son began to speak. And again, that's in Luke chapter 7. Jairus' daughter here walked and ate food. And in John chapter 11, Lazarus was loosed from the grave clothes. Now here's the point. When a lost sinner is raised from the dead, you'll know when a lost sinner is raised from the dead, Let me say that again. The way to really know that a lost sinner has been raised from the dead, you'll be able to tell by their speech, his walk, his appetite, and his change of clothes. And I'm not talking about this. I'm just talking about everything. The way they live, the way they conduct themselves. You cannot hide life. 
you cannot hide true life. It can't be hidden. It'll be known. This chapter, chapter 8 concludes the second year of Jesus' public ministry. And by this point, Jesus began to be clear about what his mission was. Here in this chapter, one thing stands out. Everywhere Jesus went, he looked for one thing, faith. That's what he was looking for. Such faith, such faith brought healing. It also brought commitment. Commitment to listen, obey, testify, and believe. As he sought faith that brought commitment, Jesus had one request. Listen to the word of God. How a person listens determines his and her growth and commitment. Growth and commitment determine a person's relationship to God and eternal destiny. Only those who truly listen, only those who truly listen to, hear, and obey the word of God retain his word in their heart, live it in their lives, and preserve through all temptations to produce, remember this word, a good crop. In this chapter, Jesus sought out people with faith that would keep them going in spite of life's difficult stresses, storms, demon possession, disease, and death were not deterrents to people who had faith in Jesus. The natural world, the world of spirits, the world of suffering and frustration, the underworld, and even the world of death proved no match for Jesus. And to this day, at this very moment, he still calls us, he still calls for such faith as we walk in the daily stresses of life. Can you listen to God's word and obey it? Do you have the faith to follow when the path seems nowhere, leads, leads nowhere, are you so committed to Jesus that all other commitments fade into nothing? I want to encourage you to listen to God's word so intently that you grow in it. Doing so will help you to trust in him when life storms frighten you. Speechless, when you're just so scared you can't even talk. When you can't even move. You don't know where to go. You're just paralyzed with fear. And the more you trust in him, and the more you obey him, the, again, as I mentioned, the easier it will be. And again, the more you obey him, even if it means, and, and we, we must continually obey him even if it means ignoring friends family and even business commitments being committed to him is much more important than those things we need to understand those things and we need to understand that that that, that principle that fact it's more important to be committed to him than to anything else so let me ask you will you testify to him among the people who drive him away in fear and desperation? Will you trust him to help you when the rest of the world laughs at him and scorns him? And lastly, let me ask you, will you have, do you have a fearless faith? A fearless faith like this anonymous woman, a fearless faith like Jairus. He believed in spite of all the circumstances, in spite of everything that was, they believed in spite of everything that was going on. Now in a moment, we, 
we partaking in communion together as a church family. But before I do, I want to invite just anybody who has maybe walked away from their faith, has walked away from Jesus, and anybody that has never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and, and after hearing this message, you now want to make a commitment to Him. You believe that He has the answers that you need, that you've been searching for and looking for your entire life, and haven't been able to found Him through drugs, alcohol, porn, and every other addiction. Let me tell you, He wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to come in and make His home in you if you just allow Him. So if that's you and you're listening, watching, or, or, or you're here and, and you're ready to make that commitment, I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. To be born again. So if that's you, wherever you're at, close your eyes and bow your head and, and pray this. God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for all that I've done. I believe and accept responsibility for my actions, for my sins. I no longer run from them. I believe Jesus Christ, your son, came to die on the cross for my sins. And now I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I confess him as Lord. Clean me now for all, from all my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Help me, Lord, from now on to, to walk according to your ways. Thank you for making me a child. In Jesus' name, amen.